Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Expert Network. My name is Yvonne Mwangi and I'm the Trail Resources and Planning Manager here at RTC. Our topic for today is the economic potential of the Great American Rail Trail. This webinar is a service of our Trail Expert Network, which is a learning and information exchange platform that's provided for trail professionals and advocates by RTC. In addition to this webinar, we also provide the services shown on your screen, including an exclusive newsletter and peer-to-peer -peer learning on our 10 Facebook group. You can sign up to join the 10 network using the link shown on your screen. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Great to be here today and thank you all for joining us. This webinar will be 85 minutes long and we will um, devote the last 15 minutes to Q&A. So please don't be shy about asking questions in the Q&A box. We've got a great panel of speakers today who will discuss the economic impact of the Great American Rail Trail. First up will be Liz Thorstensen. She's the Vice President of Trail Development at Rails to Trails Conservancy. We've also got Megan Lawson. She's an economist at Headwaters Economics in Bozeman, Montana. And we've got Brandon Garrett, Chief of Staff at the City of Council Bluffs, Iowa. So if you go back to the previous slide, I wanna talk briefly about what the Great American Rail Trail is. It is a cross-country multi-use trail, which is a project of Rails to Trails Conservancy in partner with hundreds of our trail partners across the country. It is, when completed, it'll be 3,700 miles total between Washington, D.C. and Washington State. Currently, it's 53% complete with about 2,030 miles on the ground and uh, another 1,700 miles to build along 83 gaps across the country. The map on the screen here shows you the 12 states in D.C. that it goes across between D.C. and Washington. The economic impact information in this webinar is going to be specific to the Great American Rail Trail. Uh, we know that trail use increases when trails are connected to each other. Since this is one long trail comprised of over 150 individual trails and counting, we know that it will have outsized economic benefits. However, these concepts are applicable to trails across the country that are not part of the Great American Rail Trail, perhaps not to the same scale, but taking advantage of the economic development potential of trails is very important. Uh, so Mary Ellen, could you please pop up that first qu polling question? We would love to hear what your primary role is at your job. We wanna understand who is part of this webinar today. So please tell us where you're approaching this conversation from your professional background. Are you a trail transportation planner or advocate? Do you work for an economic development authority or a chamber of commerce? Are you in tourism, in the outdoor economy in general and public health or at other? And we'll give a few minutes, uh, maybe a few, 10 seconds or so for folks to click and then Mary, Ann will, Mary Ellen will show us who is here. All right, are things looking good, Mary Ellen? I'll give another five seconds or so. Oh, right, there we go. Let's do it. There we go. Great, thank you all so much. We've got a large section of people who are trail transportation planners or advocates, that's great and good economic development input as well. So thank you very much for that. We'll be asking a couple more questions as we go along throughout this webinar. But I wanna take a moment now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Liz Thorstensen. She leads a multidisciplinary team of planners, project managers, and advocates towards implementing Rails to Trails Conservancy Trail Nation program, focused on catalyzing the rapid development of regional trail and active transportation networks from concept to implementation across nine regions and 21 states. Liz takes a holistic approach, applying RTC's depth of expertise and collaborative strategies to reflect local realities while leveraging emerging opportunities. Her interest in trail connectivity began during her childhood in Chicagoland, where she grew up exploring the trail corridors of Cook County's forest preserve system, the country's largest urban conservation preserve. Liz's career spans over 15 years with a focus on active transportation systems, sustainable development, clean energy, and equitable economic recovery and development strategies. She's passionate about linking the benefits of active transportation systems with equitable outcomes for people and planet. Please take it away, Liz. Thanks so much, Kevin. 
I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. We are going to start before I go into my slides and ask you another question. So I love to ask audiences this question. And because we have so many trail folks, not surprising that we do, i uh, love to ask you, how often do you interact with your economic development professionals in your community, your region, your state? Let us know. Never, rarely, somewhat often, frequently, or you you are one of the people that said you're an economic development professional. So we'll give you a few seconds. How often do you collaborate with your economic development colleagues and peers? How are we looking, Mary Ellen? Okay, this is, this, is, this is improving. When I would ask people this question maybe a decade ago, um, you know, I got a, a lot of never. So we've got 27%, uh, rarely, somewhat often 36%, frequently 22%, um, and then about 7% of you are in the economic development profession, which is great that you're here. We're so glad that you're here. So it, we're making good progress on doing that collaboration. You know, looks like we can, we have room, we have room to improve. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of focus on that um, in some of my talking points at the end of today's webinar. So thank you so much for, for sharing this. So I want to talk a little bit about why why are we, why do we do this study? Why are we talking about this today? Um, we really wanted to look at what the economic impact of the Great American Rail Trail was because we know the more that we look at trails and trail networks, we know that they are foundational to economic development opportunities and to economic competitiveness. So really critical for us to be paying more attention to this, for us to be sharing that information, especially with you, uh, those of you in the trail development profession, um, those of you who are advocates, planners, working for agencies, elected officials, we want to spotlight this topic. And like we said, this data that we're going to share today um, that Megan is going to share is specific to the Great American Rail Trail, but really um, we're sharing a, a lot of information that you can just use in general in terms of how to how to activate and leverage trails for economic development. So I wanted to spotlight um, as, a, as a really great point to start with, this was a great piece that came out from the Brookings Institute this past January of this year. You can see the headline, improving quality of life, not just business is the best path to Midwestern rejuvenation. And so this was um, a qualitative and quantitative actually study that they did at Brookings and they found that many of these Midwestern towns they studied had higher estimated quality of life. And the quality of life, a lot of that, not all, but a lot of it was determined by having access to natural amenities like recreation, lakes, and mountains. And when they did their analysis of these places, they found that across the country and in the Midwest especially, that natural amenities are really associated with higher levels of economic growth. But there are some areas, including the industrial Midwest, for example, where those amenities exist, they're nearby, but they really haven't been leveraged, meaning they haven't been developed, there's really no economy around them for people to access them and enjoy them or to make them part of kind of the local culture. And so there was an example they shared where in Ohio, they, they found that natural amenities aren't associated with higher growth, not because there was a lack of woods or parks or coastlines or trails, but because those places haven't really been repurposed and rebranded as part of the community's economic development strategy in comparison to some other places that they had studied. And one place they cited that did a really great job of leveraging these assets was Traverse City, Michigan. So I would encourage you if you just put that title and you put Griffins into to Google and I'll, I'll share the link in a few minutes to check this out. But there's just more and more of this data coming out um, slowly over time. But anecdotally, we know, you know, we know that it's true how important this is to, um, to making more competitive places. And I would say it's even more true with how much of a shift we've seen in the economy with a lot of folks working from home the last two and a half years. 
So I'm trying to switch to the next slide and okay, having a just for the RTC team to know, um, having a, a little slow. Um, so I also wanted to share, there was a great piece that came out from the Menino survey of mayors. This data I will acknowledge is a bit dated. This was from mid 2020, but I thought it was really telling that three out of every four mayors, they survey mayors from all over the country, said that they expect residents to spend more time visiting parks and green space than they did before the pandemic. We've seen those numbers. Um, they did spike during the peak of COVID, but we have seen them um, still maintain over 2019 numbers. So still, um, still an upward trend there. And then they saw roughly two thirds expect of those mayors expected residents will spend more time biking or, um, or walking. And then if these expectations hold, this, they saw this meaning that equitable investment in parks and open space and trails will become even more critical as a foundation for an inclusive city or town. And then the final point is that they also, though, predicted that it would be harder to continue to fund those things competitively. So that's something we want to pay close attention to. And that's something we spend a lot of time advocating um, here for at Rails to Trails is making sure that a variety of funding streams um, uh, remain and, and grow. So again, the reason we're doing this, we know that assets like the Great American Rail Trail, like trail networks all over the country, it's more than just a trail. That's the, the big message of today. It's more than just a trail. We love this quote from our great partner out in Washington State, John Snyder, who's the Outdoor Recreation and Economic Development Policy Advisor to the governor. He said, there are no cheap silver bullets in economic development, but a long distance trail comes close to it. It brings in tourist dollars while also creating local activity in the town it runs through, helping sell shoes, bikes, and pumping up streetscape vitality. So I love John's quotes. And one of the things that we were really intentional about when we started this Great American Rail Trail project was that one of the goals, again, was not just to have a trail. Again, it's an amazing vision. It's exciting so many people. It excites us. But we want one of the main benefits of this project to be to support community economic development all over the country, in rural places, suburban places, urban places. And we know from our estimates that the Great American Rail Trail is going to cost about a billion dollars to complete. But from this study that Megan's going to take you through in just a few seconds, we know that this will be recouped in a really short amount of time within five years, just by direct visitor spending alone. And since the trail was announced in 2019, we know that more than $54 million has been invested across the country in projects that fill the critical gaps that Kevin mentioned a minute ago. So with that, oh, I guess I have, <laughs> I have one more point um, and then I'll pass it on to Megan. Another reason we look at this is that we know trail connectivity really matters. And it matters not because we only care about someone being able to go a long distance on a trail. We think that's great, but it's really about access. It's making sure that all people, as many people as possible, have access to a trail. And we did this study a few years ago. We know that when trail connections are made, usage increases anywhere from 40 to 80%. So when you fill a gap between one trail and another, or you connect two trails together, we see an incredible amount of usage go up and access go up. So we think that's really, really important. So these were just a few framing points to kind of uh, whet your appetite for why this is important, why we're looking at it. And now I'm really happy to turn it over to Megan, who's going to go into the details of the, the methodology and the results of our economic impact study for the Great American Rail Trail. And thank you, Liz. I'll just chime in real quick to do, do a brief introduction for Megan. Megan Lawson leads Headwaters Economics Research in Outdoor Recreation, Economic Development, and Demographics. She has more than 20 years of experience as a quantitative economist analyzing policies and trends for communities, governments, and nonprofit organizations. And Megan is saying hello from Bozeman, Montana today. Take it away, Megan. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. Let's see. There we go. Um, so I'm so delighted to be sharing uh, the results of this study with everyone on the call today and to be a part of this panel. Um, so, but before I go too far, I want to give you a little bit of background about um, Headwaters Economics. Um, we are an independent nonprofit, nonpartisan research group. As Kevin mentioned, I am based in Bozeman. Um, there we go. 
Um, but we're, we do research nationally. Um, and our aim is to do data-driven research to improve community development and land management decisions. So we conduct economic research. We translate data and information into tools that people can use to offer policy insights and help support and advance community solutions. Uh, I'm, as Kevin mentioned, I'm an economist at Headwaters and I lead our research on outdoor recreation and public lands. I don't wanna hit advance too many times. There we go. Oh. I hit it too many times. So uh, during my presentation today, I'm gonna to cover four topics um, related to this study. So first I'll talk about the methods that we used. Um, then I'll talk about visitor spending and economic impacts. Um, so really the, the meat of the results. And I'll talk about some other research that we've done that I think might be, of, <clears throat> excuse me, might be of interest to this group um, about the benefits from having a robust outdoor recreation economy and then I'll conclude with some thoughts on how to tailor, tailor your message effect, to effectively communicate the results from these findings and other research. So for the methods. So our methods, our approach to calculate the economic impacts is divided into three steps. First, we estimated how many people are using the trail today in those sections that are already completed, or how many will be using the trail uh, once the trail, um, those connections are made and the trail is complete. So we relied first on actual counts of people uh, from trail counters either on or near the trails. Um, and this was that we used trail counters from 57 counties across the US. And we leaned on local knowledge to <clears throat> use counters um, in the best places, in the most relevant places. Um, in the other places where we had no counters, those, count, those uh, trail counts inform, form the basis for a statistical model. Um, and that statistical model incorporated population density, demographics, uh, the degree of urbanization, uh, to predict trail use once the trail is completed. The second step, uh, we involve estimating how much visitors would spend when they come to use the trail. This is really the heart of economic impact analyses. So we use spending um, estimates from 14 credible studies that did surveys of users from similar trails. Um, so definitely like a rail trail style trails from across the US. And from this survey, we um, estimate that day users will spend on average about $58 per day. And overnight users were, will spend on average about $129 per day. And then the last step combined the counts of trips and spending estimates into a software program called Implan which uses economic data from each county to calculate how many jobs, um, how much income, contributions to GDP, tax revenue will be generated by visitors to the trail. Now, I wanna mention here that, <clears throat> excuse me, this modeling assumes that the trail will be connected and maintained well to allow users of different um, abilities and mobilities and we assume that communities are going to capitalize on this economic opportunity. Like Liz mentioned from that Brookings study, um, there's some places that have really managed to capitalize on their assets through different means like wayfinding, supporting businesses, um, offering events and that kind of thing. Right. And I wanna take a moment to talk about, um, a little bit down in the weeds about the economic impacts and how we think about dollars moving through the economy, just to give you a sense for where these numbers are coming from. So I want you to hold in your mind the ice cream cones that I buy for my family after a day of biking on this trail. Okay, so there are three types of impacts. The first direct impact is when I go into the ice cream store and spend money on those ice cream cones. Um, and so that's at the ice cream store, at gear stores, restaurants, 
and that supports uh, the salaries for workers and it supports those business owners. Then we can think about the indirect impact of those dollars that I spent. And this is really thinking about the supply chain upstream um, from that ice cream cone, ice cream shop. Um, and so it's the company that provides the ice cream cones, the napkins, the dairy, everything that feeds into that business. And so that, that's supporting the supply chain upstream. And then the third piece is the induced impact. And this is where the folks who work in that ice cream shop use their wages to buy groceries, to visit the doctor, to uh, fix up their house at the hardware um, with supplies from the hardware store. And so this is how those initial dollars spent on the ice cream cone can travel throughout the economy locally as well as regionally. And we sum these three different economic impacts um, to estimate the total impacts of the trail. And now I'm going to transition to talking about um, the overall impact of the Great American Rail Trail. So we estimate for the trips um, that the trail is going to bring. This includes visitors who will come to use the trails as well as people who are already in the community and what they're, um, they're gonna go use the trails. So we estimate that there'll be about uh, 25 and a half million trips annually this will result in close to $230 million in annual spending in communities along the trail. And this, I wanna emphasize that this is outside money that is coming in. This is money that wouldn't or otherwise um, be in the community. This spending is gonna support, is going to support about 2,500 new jobs and associated about $100 million of labor income um, in these communities. It's also going to support about $23 million in both state and local tax revenue. And it'll contribute to um, about $160 million to the state GDP. So now we summarize these results nationally, which is that um, the previous slide I just showed you, as well as by state. Uh, and as you can see from looking at this slide, the results do vary widely. Um, across the US, depending on both mileage in the state and proximity to population. And um, as you can see where this uh, little line goes, the solid line is where the trail already exists. And the dashed line is those gaps um, that Kevin and, and Liz are working hard to fill. And so these figures are estimates of the current economic impact or the potential, um, summing these two. And the economic benefits range from $800,000 of visitor spending a year in West Virginia, which has just shy of nine miles of trail in it, um, to as much as in Maryland, which is an example of a trail um, that's already a destination for locals and visitors, where we forecast about $43 million annually over those 200 miles of trail. And now I wanna emphasize that the Great American Rail Trail um, those jobs that I talked about, those 2,500 jobs, um, they're going to support diverse industries. So it will support those traditional hospitality industries like that ice cream shop, um, lodging, retail, restaurants, but also a lot of other parts of the economy, like professional services, manufacturing, real estate, and healthcare. And that's because that dollar that I spend on, ice, on the ice cream cone is going to move through the local economy. So I wanna show this slide as an example and to tee up Brandon, um, as an example of the state specific summaries that we have. Um, and we have those for each, of the, um, for each of the states that the Great American Route crosses. And so for each of these, um, they're structured so that you can print it off um, and hand it out and use it for communications in the places where you're working. And now I've, I've been focusing really on the benefits from visitors who are coming to use the trail. But of course, there's a lot more than that. And I wanna take a moment to talk about some other research that we have done on um, highlighting the economic opportunity from outdoor recreation communities. So this chart shows um, the migration between 2010 and 2019 for 
in rural counties across the US, the green bar shows places that have an outdoor recreation economy, and the dark blue bars show places that do not have a re recreation economy. And so as you can see, places with recreation counties or recreation economies have on average gained population over the last decade, and places without outdoor recreation have lost, um, have lost population. And we know that a lot of the Great American Route goes through rural communities across the US. And I think that's really a tremendous economic opportunity um, and something that's unique about this particular project. Because when a place is gaining population, it means that the community schools, grocery stores, and libraries can stay open, Main Street stays vibrant, um, and it means that the tax base can stay robust. And I want to change gears a bit to talk about tailoring your message. So this is a really big and exciting project and that's going to benefit communities in a lot of different ways. But how do we zero in on what's going to be most impactful so we don't just provide our audiences with an, um, a fire hose of information? Uh, and this is, I want to emphasize that this is not a matter of hiding information, um, but really highlighting what matters most to a particular audience because folks are busy um, and don't have a lot of time. So if we, when we have their attention, we want to be sure to use it wisely. So to support this economic impact study, we created a companion research um, for the report called Tailoring Your Message. And I'm going to go through a couple of highlights. So when we're thinking about some strategies for impactful advocacy, we think about three things. First, your audience the issues of interest that they care about, what resonates with them, and then given those issues, what specific messages uh, resonate, resonate most. So with this particular project, uh, we really think about our audience in three buckets, um, public officials and agencies, businesses and business leaders, and economic development professionals, and private citizens. Now, within each of these three buckets, there are several subcategories, but I'm going to keep it high level for this presentation. So if we, um, so for each of these particular audiences, um, you know, I want to focus on just narrow, uh, narrowly on public officials and agencies um, as an example. So they're likely to care most about community health, safety, and welfare, about fiscal responsibility and budget, budgeting, and about economic diversification. And so with this in mind, we can highlight certain aspects of the trail. So we can highlight the fact that it's going to increase state and local tax revenues by attracting visitors and attracting new spending. We can talk about the trail as a source of community cohesion and pride. And we can talk about how the trail is going to complement existing community plans and strategies like comprehensive plans, transportation plans, um, climate or sustainability related plans. And so there's a lot more detail um, in this companion document and where this is going to be completed and posted in the next couple of weeks. And so this is kind of what the whole report looks like. It's posted on our website and RTCs. Um, within this, there's a lot more details about the methods. Um, this is where you can also find those state responses state specific reports, um, as well as um, all of the infographics that I used in this uh, presentation. And then finally, we're uh, continually adding new data, adding new research to our website um, related to outdoor recreation, as well as um, our research on equity and uh, living with natural hazards and adapting to that. So we send out a newsletter about six times a year. If you want to subscribe to it, the information is here in the QR code um, if you'd like to do that. And with that, I will turn it back to Kevin. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Always appreciate seeing those big numbers on screen that we can finally talk about. All right, let me pivot now to a, an on-the-ground example, and we'll go to Brandon Garrett, who's been with the City of Council Bluff since 2017 first as the Community Development Director, and now as the Chief of Staff. Prior to that, he worked for the City of Lincoln, Nebraska for 11 years as a long-range city planner. Brandon is a certified public manager and a certified planner. 
He has a master's degree in community and regional planning from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a bachelor's degree in geography from Kansas State University. He is originally from Great Bend, Kansas. He and his wife have a son, two Italian greyhounds, and five chickens. He has a special interest in mixed-use development, placemaking, and multimodal transportation. He enjoys visiting cities around the world. It has been said that Brandon spends an inappropriate amount of time taking pictures of city stuff while on vacation. So look forward to hearing what you have to say, Brandon. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And uh, that picture of my face there, uh, I think it was, uh, I took a selfie, I think, when I received uh, Kevin's invitation to give this uh, this presentation. My family was in London and I always take bike pictures there too. I think I sent a couple to Kevin while on vacation. So um, thank you. So uh, First Ave in Council Bluffs, Council Bluffs, Iowa. Um, first of all, our city's mission is to continuously improve the quality of life and attractiveness of the city of Council Bluffs. There's a crew of, of people enjoying our new First Ave uh, multi-use trail. Uh, that particular day was uh, about negative 20 wind chill. So uh, they were bundled up. Where is Council Bluffs, Iowa? We're right in the middle of the continent, um, almost as far away from mountains and beaches as you could possibly get. So um, we do focus heavily on quality of life improvements, um, you know, in, at retention and attraction of our workforce to the uh, Omaha Council Bluffs Metro. And zooming in a little bit, where is Council Bluffs in the, the Omaha, Nebraska, Council Bluffs, Iowa Metro on the Missouri River? We are the, the little brother to Omaha on the Iowa side of the Missouri River. We are part of a growing metro. Uh, so even though we are in kind of a rural kind of region, uh, it is a metropolitan area of over a million people. And uh, with a lot of the, uh, the healthy economics uh, in our region, uh, we are projected to grow by another 500,000 people over the next three decades. Council Bluffs, looking specifically to where I work, uh, our part of the metro is, is currently about 63,000 people. And uh, just from a demographic standpoint, about 50% uh, of our households are below the national poverty level. Part of the, uh, the impact of, of uh, the, I guess, the growth of, of our Metro is the University of Nebraska Med Center and their recent announcement uh, of a major expansion to add uh, 8,700 new uh, high paying jobs. Uh, and their campus is less than three miles west of Council Bluffs. So uh, it will indefinitely have an impact on us. In addition, uh, just a couple of months ago, Mutual of Omaha, a large insurance provider, uh, announced that they were going to construct a new corporate headquarters uh, just a mile west of Council Bluffs in downtown Omaha. So our big question is, where, all, where will all these people go? Uh, we, we have a lot of jobs coming here and we, we don't have any housing currently. Uh, on either side of the river. And uh, it, when you look at new growth areas, suburban Omaha is now 30 to 45 minutes from where a lot of these jobs will be located. And uh, that plays well to Council Bluffs, which is essentially at the doorstep of downtown Omaha. So we are very well positioned for redevelopment and housing in Council Bluffs. So one of the things that we've looked at is this former Chicago and Northwestern Railway. Uh, when the city was platted uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, they, they platted out you know, large areas of the city and uh, the, the Chicago and Northwestern Railway ended up claiming what would have been First Avenue in Council Bluffs. And uh, so we never did build that street. The railway was there um, for about 150 years until relatively recently. Um, so this is kind of a look at uh, a segment of, of what will be part of the Great American Rail Trail, First Avenue. Um, it's, it's now city-owned right-of-way. The, the railroad tracks were pulled out um, about five, seven years ago. And so since it was city right-of-way, it basically just reverted back to city ownership. And um, 
it's just one block south of our major east-west roadway. Uh, it's U.S. Highway 6, the former uh, Lincoln Highway, that uh, is that direct connection uh, between downtown Omaha and downtown Council Bluffs. It's a 66-foot right-of-way for us to work with, and this particular segment that we uh, call First Ave is just under two miles. You can see there in the, the lower left is a snapshot uh, from 2006 where uh, the, when the railroad existed there, there were two sets of tracks and they actually stored uh, rail cars uh, right on a high school campus. So we'll, we'll look at a couple pictures of that here later as well. Uh, First Ave, it's interesting. I, I thought maybe I coined that uh, it's more than a trail because I use it all the time. So um, that, that's a little disappointing, but uh, I think the message uh, resonates here in Council Bluffs, Iowa. So why is it more than a trail? First Ave is um, more than just a trail for us. It's, it's a whole effort uh, and it's an acronym for furthering interconnections, revitalization, streetscapes, transportation, and aesthetics for a vibrant economy. So it's kind of an all of, all of the above approach uh, for redevelopment and economic development in this corridor. Big picture connections, uh, you know, over the years, I think uh, the city of Council Bluffs and, and Omaha, our partners to the West have done a good job at uh, putting together a trail network, largely recreational based uh, using uh, levees and parks, et cetera, to start building out a trail network. But where you can see kind of highlighted in pink there, we didn't have a connection that went straight through town uh, and making that direct connection between downtown Council Bluffs and downtown Omaha. And that's where you can see the kind of that lighter green color cutting right through that pink area. That's First Avenue. And that's primarily what I'll be talking about. And of course, and the reason I was invited to this call was our position on the Great American Rail Trail. See the yellow star right there, we're um, right in the middle. So, uh, you know, I, we expect that uh, we'll, we'll get a lot of visitors over time to the, to the trail and, and to, uh, to Council Bluffs, whether you're just biking across Iowa or biking across the country. And uh, Kevin, uh, was so kind to uh, allow Council Bluffs to have uh, sort of uh, two options to get uh, through Council Bluffs. There's uh, the completed segment that kind of takes a more circuitous route uh, around the south side of Council Bluffs. That's kind of more of a scenic greenway where not very many people live. Um, and what we're working on now is that area highlighted in red is First Avenue that really cuts right through our community provides excellent access to our residents. In fact, uh, that segment there that, that uh, more directly goes through our community, uh, we have about one third of our residents live within a half mile of that segment. And if you went out a little further, uh, if you went maybe a mile out, it's probably more like two thirds of our residents live within a mile of that. So we're very excited to um, focus on the, this first Ave segment and this more direct routes that will really be kind of like an arterial uh, of bike traffic through our community and then uh, spur off from there uh, with, with other connections and really building a robust bikeway system in, in Council Bluffs and into Omaha. Also within this corridor, this first Ave area, we do have free city Wi-Fi throughout that area. So that does, um, help with uh, whether it's visitors or uh, some businesses or redevelopment and residential construction, et cetera. That's uh, a major attraction. Um, just part of that big picture of connections. The trail itself, we like to call a multi-use trail. We have again, the 66 feet of right of way. And uh, here's a kind of a cross section and plan view of, of what we've done with that 66 feet. We essentially offset it to the south. So about the south, 30 feet or so, we placed the trail and I'll explain that a little bit later. But here's a cross section of what the trail looks like. And uh, there's a picture below there. Essentially the trail itself is 14 to 16 feet wide, depending on where you're at in the corridor. 
and it's made up of a 10 to 12 foot asphalt surface with two foot shoulders. And uh, it, it is interesting, people do use those two foot uh, shoulders to, to walk on, uh, especially maybe the slower moving uh, foot traffic. And uh, part of the reason we chose these surfaces was the, the city's ability to make repairs uh, or replacements if, if we needed to versus a more specialized surface, uh, whether it's our public works department or our parks department, uh, we have the uh, equipment and uh, materials to go out and make repairs as necessary. Here's a plan view of the trail concept. Uh, again, we, we wanted to focus on just the south half of that right of way, and we also didn't want to meander the trail all over the place. So we do take uh, kind of an, a long angle uh, and, and then use that long angle to create planting opportunities for street trees and, and uh, native plantings. Uh, and for the, the trees themselves, <clears throat> we've selected what we call fall color corridor trees so that the trees themselves will <clears throat> in essence be an attraction in the future especially as they mature here's a, a picture of when they were planted just last fall so you can see they'll they'll be a, a very bright red um, uh, row of trees through there <clears throat> now an essential element of the trail uh, was the trail lighting and it isn't cheap, but it is very necessary. In fact, we we spent, I think, almost just as much on lighting elements as we did the paving of the trail itself. But uh, what it does create is a very visible and safe environment where not only you can see the people uh, on the trail or off to the sides, but you can see if there's any obstructions, you know, is there is there ice, is there a branch or or anything like that so that it's a 24-hour facility and, and that's what we wanted from the very beginning because it's not just for recreation it's for transportation as well getting people to their jobs and to their education and entertainment all of those things we want it to be a 24-7 type of facility here's a snapshot of that uh, thomas jefferson high school that i talked about earlier where there used to be two sets of tracks and they used to uh, even store cars on there. Here's a, a picture of uh, after they removed the tracks, but um, kind of in that interim time period before the trail went in. This is just kind of a, a couple of rusty fences and um, ugly uh, piles of, of uh, railroad aggregate, etc. cetera, uh, throughout the corridor. And this is what it looks like as of maybe two weeks ago. So now we have this beautiful trail that goes through there and uh, all new fencing and landscaping and of course lighting. And now this provides a new safe way for the students to, to, get, to, to get to school. And um, interestingly, but before we went through this effort, uh, the school district said they weren't interested in a trail because it was going to attract all sorts of people, et cetera. And, and uh, hardly any kids bike to school. Um, and if you go there now, well, I guess school's out of session now, but um, they don't have enough bike parking now. So I've, I've been trying to get them grants uh, for, for new bike parking uh, so that these, uh, these students can have a safe place to, to, pike, to park their, uh, their transportation investments. Here's a, more of an aerial shot. You can see right through the middle of their campus, they had the, the two sets of tracks and where that was shown is this is this is what it looks like today. Uh, we kind of created more of a plaza area, area in that location where we we put in some seating walls for the the students to to gather and and uh, some more native plantings and lots of lighting so that it's it's nice and safe. And uh, they have two buildings in this location, so there's a lot of foot traffic between uh, their two buildings in this particular location. And here's just a shot of now the students use this uh, trail to get to their PE class out on the, the track and field there on campus. So they use it every day. Uh, we have trail plazas every three to four blocks. We have six plazas total. And uh, we, we went with elements um, that kind of go back to our industrial past in this corridor. Since it was a railroad corridor, there were a lot of industrial uses. So we went with 
I-beam construction and concrete and, and wood. And, and our benches were designed to kind of look like uh, bundles of lumber that uh, were ready to be hauled off by the next train. Uh, there's a, a crew of people there hanging out uh, on one of our plazas. And I trouble advancing my slide now. Okay, there we go. Uh, one of our plazas will have a Heartland B cycle station, and that'll help with our big picture connections uh, within the metro system. And we've also included art pedestals in our uh, plaza areas. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're going behind a lot of uh, buildings along that old Highway 6, so lots of opportunities for murals along that corridor. And then in the future, um, we, we did conduct a study for um, redevelopment of this area, which included um, transit and uh, redevelopment. So as part of that effort, a lot of rezoning, we rezoned out uh, all of the, the old industrial because it's, it's started to turn more towards residential and commercial. We added new design standards so that things that would be constructed in that area had an eye towards the pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Created new mixed use zoning with uh, minimum densities and design standards. And here's a couple of the projects that uh, we have uh, approved along First Avenue. This one has 100 units, multifamily and townhomes. Uh, this one is uh, two to 300 units uh, with multifamily townhomes and commercial, about $40 million of investment. And in the future uh, with the city of Omaha committing to modern streetcar, we have that opportunity in Council Bluffs as well. And we have begun the study of that, which would involve a multimodal bridge over the Missouri River, much like we had many years ago. And that space that we had reserved um, if we so choose, could be for future transit. So all of those plazas were placed where we would have future transit stops. You would convert those to transit stops. They would still serve as, as bike uh, plazas as well. But uh, that's the big picture, a connected metro core, starting with the multi-use trail and then uh, having a look towards the future uh, for transit uh, if, if we decide to go that direction. Uh, we do have a podcast called On First. At least check out the episode where we had our special guest, Kevin Belanger, uh, that talks about the Great American Rail Trail. And we have a website, firstavcb.com. Contact me for more information. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. Great to see all those awesome pictures of Council Bluffs. As you said before, I have not been there yet, but I look forward to getting to see the trail, especially when it's more complete. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions, so keep them coming. We've got about 25 minutes for Q&A, so we are good on time here. I'm going to tee up a few questions. We have some specific questions for some panelists and some group questions. I'm going to tee up to Megan first. Um, I loved everything you said. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just was reminded, we're not done yet. We're going back to Liz. So excuse me, Liz, please. Take us home. Thanks so much, Kevin. I'm just gonna kind of um, kind of tie together all the great threads we just heard from Megan and Brandon. And I love how Megan shared the the tailoring your message thoughts. And I love hearing from Brandon, kind of how this vision of First Ave is a is really a trail oriented de development, you know, vision for Council Bluffs. So I, if I can advance my slides, um, right now I can't. <laughs> um, I have a few more thoughts to share. Um, RTC team, I'm not able to advance, so maybe, okay, there we go. So just to tie it all together for a few minutes before you go to Q&A, whether you're on the Great American Rail Trail or you're on your own trail network or another long distance trail, thinking about everything we heard today, how, what are some things you can think about if you want to leverage a trail or a trail network for economic development? Next slide, please. So 
So the reason we asked at the beginning, kind of who, who, what's your role and, you know, how often do you talk to the economic development folks is we really need everyone to be connecting and talking. My experience when I worked um, directly in economic development is that the mid-sized and smaller places, the folks that work on that level, they're really good at talking to each other. So where Brandon's sitting, you know, I think um, uh, folks in Brandon's seat, like Brandon are really good at talking to all these different groups and coordinating. I think as places get um, bigger, I think that gets more challenging or in really small places, you might not even have all these roles or one person might be having to play all these roles, right? Um, and so I think that's where it gets hard. But basically, this advice is really, and if you want to do this, if you want to have success, um, at trail, trail-oriented development, at trail tourism, at trail towns, whatever the scale and scope you're thinking about is, is really to, to be able to coordinate across all the people in these different kinds of positions and roles and to get creative about that. Next slide, please. And so to do that, you have to be really, really intentional. So going back to what I mentioned before, no matter what role you are, and, and we thank you to the economic development folks who are attending today, we need your help to help us support funding for trails, recreation, conservation, the outdoor economy. Having that funding to be able to create this infrastructure is, is, is kind of ground, ground zero, the basic level that we need. So we all have to continue doing that. And then, again, in coordinating across our sectors, across the trail and economic development sectors and the tourism sector is, again, seeing the trail or the trail network as an opportunity for leveraging a larger economic development initiative. So it's not a separate thing, right, but it can help to spark so many of the things how Brandon just showed you how the housing development is going to go next to First Ave, how that's part of a trail-oriented development strategy. So thinking about things complementing and supporting each other rather than in separate bubbles. And, um, and again, the point I just made about having these different agencies, different folks having to really come together, work together, bring their resources together. And then really thoughtful, and once you have something ready to go and you have all the pieces aligned, really having thoughtful and coordinated marketing and promotion. And one thing we found that I think um, a lot of you can attest to is, is how important events are. And we have had multiple webinars over the years just on events. So you can go to our webinar page and, and check those out. Next slide, please. So a few things to think about of what maybe your role is, or if it's not your direct role, how you can be thinking about what is your ask? when you are coordinating with your colleagues and peers or you're making that pitch to, to you know, tailoring your message that Megan shared, um, you know, that, that's really great in terms of thinking of the making the case, you know, why should you care about this? But then what's your ask of those people if, if you're not that person? So here are some thoughts on some, some different pieces that need to come together. You know, what's the vision? Having the vision for what are you trying to achieve? That means dedicating resources to developing this trail corridor as a destination. What does that mean? Um, what's the scale of that going to be? And, you know, if you take Brandon's example from Council Bluff, it's really trail-oriented development, you know, a mix of housing, commercial, retail, office, future transportation options like he shared. Proactively thinking about what are going to be the barriers to doing that from a legal point, from a land standpoint. Um, from economic incentives and what are business needs. And then having, you know, if you want to get a great mix of, especially retail, really having resources to bringing those businesses on, assisting small business owners to get through that really difficult startup process, having small business financing available, and really educating on what's going to be the customer base that you're looking to, to capture through, through the trail corridor project. Next slide, please. And continuing um, some other things to consider, taking action from the very beginning, thinking about, you know, when you have success, sometimes you have too much success and things can become expensive depending on where you are and how well things go. And so you might want to do things up front to preserve um, keeping the cost low. So land banking has been um, coming, coming up more through land trusts to try to preserve affordability of housing or affordability of business corridors, thinking in that same, you know, general lens of 
incentivizing um, businesses to locate along the trail. What can you in, what can you offer as an incentive to bring them in? And then harnessing, you know, if you start to have success, how can you harness that that growth through um, value capture? Thinking about, you know, do you want to end up eventually with um, a Main Street program or a business improvement district or a tax increment financing? Again, you know, where everyone's kind of pooling pooling some money together to help help pay for the infrastructure. And we do have lots of great examples of how those mechanisms are supporting supporting trails. Um, there's a great example here in Washington, D.C. of a business improvement district supporting, um, helping support the Metropolitan Branch Trail because there's so much traffic that comes into that business district from the Metropolitan Branch Trail, which is, which is fairly recent over the last 10 to 15 years. And then thinking about and assessing regularly what are trail adjacent business owners' perceptions of the trail's impact and how can you help them to maximize it to benefit their business? Sometimes it's just talking to them and, and helping them become aware. We've done great work um, where a lot of this information that I'm presenting came from with our partners at WVU, where just doing a business survey, really just, just the conversation of doing the interviews and the survey with the local businesses along the trails just sparked a lot of new thoughts and ideas just by, just by doing the interviews. So sometimes a little bit can really go um, a really long way. Next slide, please. And then finally, you know, really important um, pretty much for all of this work is political leadership and, and buy-in. And I always love when we're talking about the great American, I love to put a spotlight to Indiana especially and how much they have put into trails on the state level through their next level trails program, which is the largest infusion of trails funding in their state's history. They put in their own money initially, and then when they got uh, American Rescue Plan money, they put in an uh, additional amount. And you can see from the quote here from Governor Holcomb that they've got political buy-in from the highest level. And when we see that at Rails to Trails, we see lots of great success. We see trails getting finished more quickly, and we see a lot of thoughtfulness around how to maximize it for these larger um, economic quality of life um, goals. And so just just want to give, um, you know, that that's really kind of kind of the, the baseline um, is really just always thinking about building that that political support uh, from the get go. And I think that's where I wrap up. So I'm going to cue it back to Kevin and he's going to run us through some audience Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, really great way to wrap that up with all that very specific information. Thank you so much. All right, now we're gonna ask some questions. So let's bring back up Megan and Brandon as well. I'm actually gonna start the first question for Megan. Um, I loved hearing about that tailoring your message piece as we've been talking about over the last few months. So can you talk a little bit more about how you give context to the numbers when talking to specific people? Let's say for instance, an elected official, what do they wanna hear and how do you um, give that context? Sure, thanks Kevin. Um, you know, I think when we're talking to elected officials, it's really important to demonstrate that you that we understand what's going on in the bigger picture um, economically um, and demographically and what are the trends and what's the bigger picture context in the community. Um, you know, so certainly that's a, a matter of kind of understanding what the trends are. Are there any, is there, you know, like what's happening uh, in Brandon's community and Council Bluffs, you know, there's these big employers and um, coming in. And so they're, you know, we're, can you hear those chickens? I'm sorry. <laughs> I live downtown in Bozeman, but my neighbors have some very vocal chickens. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, I think it's really important to understand those, um, those bigger picture economics and you know, I'm going to drop something into the chat, um, and it's a, a tool that we have that lets you look at the economic profiles of your community. So when you're going in, you can talk to your leaders about, you know, these are, we know these are the biggest employers, this is how the trail can support them, or we know this industry is struggling, um, this is how the Great American Rail Trail can help support uh, new economic development opportunities. So that's, um, you know, I think that economic and demographic context is really essential. 
Okay, thank you. Also, great to have the input from some chickens as well. Never be ashamed of that. Um, Brandon, we're going to go back over to you. I love seeing all the specific pictures of the trail happening in Council Bluffs. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about what you're specifically doing to plan for trail oriented development and what are the critical pieces you see as to making that happen. So first of all, before the trail was even constructed, there was a master plan for that entire corridor, which also included that West Broadway, which is the old Highway 6 there, just one block north. So the, the master plan included that entire corridor that included the that highway that had a lot of highway type commercial, still does, um, and then this rail corridor. Um, so that was kind of the starting point. And then we use that as a basis for changing the zoning in the area, kind of zoning out a lot of the old industrial, which most of the industrial uses had already gone away. It was just a matter of uh, rezoning so that um, some of those uses that maybe are not as conducive to redevelopment of multifamily and mixed use, um, we have those zoned out now. We also created an overlay for that entire corridor that further restricted some uses that, that maybe not um, uh, very compatible with, with creating these, these places. This is kind of all about placemaking. Um, uh, this, this trail being a central feature to that placemaking through the corridor. So not only does it make that physical connection between downtown Council Bluffs and downtown Omaha, but it's a central spine and feature to what we hope to be future residential and mixed use redevelopment. Um, within that corridor, the, the new design standards that we created really help to turn the, the front doors and the priority of facades to the trail um, so that it creates those, those warm and inviting experiences along the trail. So it's not just like the uh, facadeless sides of buildings, um, well, there's you know requirements for quality materials and windows and, and even doors and balconies, uh, all of those things, outdoor seating uh, is all uh, preferred along that um, trail frontage. So uh, I think a lot of the things that we've put in place have at least put in the, the construct for, for uh, future redevelopment um, at least for the, the developments that just happened by right with, without city involvement. Now, if there's city involvement in terms of incentives, et cetera, we can take it you know, a little further and, and, um, and require exactly what we want or need uh, along that corridor. That's great. And I appreciated what you said about rooting the Great American Rail Trail through downtown Council Bluffs instead of around it. Initially, we had picked the around option because it was complete, but one of the major criteria and goals of the Great American Rail Trail is to go through communities very specifically to go through the places to, to spend some money to build that um, energy around there. So thank you for bringing that up. Liz, we had a question about how this uh, economic impact analysis was funded because other people might be interested in doing a similar project in their communities, maybe not on the Great American Rail Trail. Liz, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. So rail to trail for this study, we were able to pay for it kind of out of our general you know, program funds. Um, but for other communities, I've seen some really creative solutions because these studies can, um, can be costly. And so I've seen uh, examples in other communities where, especially if you're working within a trail network and you're going into multiple municipalities, for example, I've seen where each community might put in, you know, five to ten thousand dollars each, kind of pooling resources. Or if you're looking at a long distance trail, you could do that, um, do that as well. So um, I think there are ways to, yeah, to get creative, um, and there are resources out there. Um, that we have on our website um, where you can kind of do some, if you want to do some kind of basics on your, on your own, um, we do kind of have some basic tools for that. But for this study, because, you know, it's so, it's so big, we're crossing the whole country, you know, we really wanted to, and we're privileged to get to work with Headwaters Economics to really take that, that deeper dive going over, you know, such the, the entire country and the diversity of economies and geographies that that, that represents. So yeah, we're, 
we're grateful we were able to to just kind of pay for that out of out of our own pocket. Thanks. And Liz, um, actually, we had another question. We wanted to pull the polling thing for question number three. Do you want to do that now, asking how people want to have support from RTC and things like this? Um, if, if you'd like to do it now or we can do it at the end, either, either one's fine. Oh, yeah. Since we've got it teed up now, why don't we go ahead, Mary Ellen, pull that question up. Sure. Um, so, Liz, if you don't mind talking about this a little bit more. Yeah, so as we as we move forward with our work here at RTC and this study, we just see this study as really the, the beginning of how we want to support, especially communities along the Great American Rail Trail and just more generally with thinking about this idea of, you know, how do you, how do you leverage trails and trail networks for economic development? And so we'd love to know um, what kinds of resources would be most helpful to have from us in your pursuit of trail-related economic development. So um, there's some choices here. Um, if there's other ideas you have, we'd love for you to put them in the chat and um, that might spark ideas for, for us. Um, or you can see um, Kevin's email there, kevinb at rails2trails.org. Um, but if one of those or one or more of those um, options on the screen makes sense to you, we'd love to just kind of get a basic um, pulse check from from you. Thank you so much. So we'll give you a few seconds to respond. All right, Mary Ellen, do you want to take us home here? Thank you. Yeah, so it looks like data and making the case talking points is a big one that most people agreed on. And thankfully, we've, we've got some good data. So that's a good thing we can find already in the study. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, another question from Megan. We had a lot of questions while you were speaking about what does it mean to be a recreation economy and how is recreation and non-recreation county defined? Yes, thank you. I'm glad I um, have a chance to give a little more detail on that. So that when I was talking about that in the presentation, I was referring to a specific um, classification provided by the US Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. Um, and I can put this in the chat. But it basically is a measure of places that have a relatively high share of jobs and income from tourism related industries and a relatively high share of housing that is second homes. So it doesn't represent, um, it doesn't measure outdoor recreation exactly. Um, it more measures the manifestation of like the economic um, manifestations of outdoor recreation. And <clears throat> the there are recreation counties across the whole country. Um, and, but I think it is important to mention that um, even among those places that are not technically classified as uh, outdoor recreation dependent, um, we know that, out, that outdoor recreation is alive and well and is an important part of the economy of many places, even though, even if places don't, aren't technically classified as dependent, it probably just means they have a lot of other things going on. Great, thank you very much. Um, Can I add a thought on that? Um, please, please. I think when you, if, and we'll share some of the links from what Megan was talking about, but one thing Megan and I have talked a lot about in this project is just, you know, even if you're not currently a recreation community, I think that's okay. Like if you look up the, the map that we'll, we'll share a link to, that's okay. You know, the whole point of this webinar and having these resources is to tr try to provide um, resources and thinking and advice for how, you know, how you might be able to get there. So I think, um, I think when people see that they're not on that, they don't qualify in that, that USDA um, uh, category that Megan shared, they're like, oh, well, that's, that's not us. So, um, you know, what, there's nothing we can do. But it's just kind of a picture of where things were at that point that that you know data was collected. So I think there's lots of opportunities. It related to everything we've shared today. Um, if that's a goal of your you know of your county of your community, um, you know there's lots of ways to to make that shift to to diversify into an outdoor recreation economy. So we'll we'll be sure to share those links as well. 
Thank you. Megan, I'm going to stay with you here. I've got another question about um, the data elements used for the analysis, specifically original statistical models to estimate trail users and also the literature view of spending estimates. I know there was a lot of time spent on that. Can you get some more information on that? Sure. Um, so for the statistical model to estimate how many folks are out using the trail, um, there's a pretty good body of peer reviewed literature on the topic. Um, so we looked at uh, approaches that other researchers and economists and transportation experts have used. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we had for this project in particular was that a lot of those models were developed for urban environments. Um, and so we had to adapt things um, so that the model worked well in rural places. Um, and the wonderful thing about having all that trail counter data was that we were able to develop the model and then go back and look at the actual trail counts to make sure that the model was predicting um, within, uh, you know, actually pretty darn close to what we were seeing on the ground. Uh, so that's how we developed the statistical model. And then for the literature review, um, again, we looked at the peer reviewed literature um, and related studies um, looking specifically at rail trails. So we didn't look, um, you know, there are other, there have been other studies that looked at the impacts of wilderness trails and hiking trails, but we really want to focus um, just on this. And I can drop a link in the chat for um, our trails library, uh, which is where we got a lot of these studies from, um, where we have aggregated about, I think at this point we're up to 140 something um, studies that have estimated the benefits of trails, both in terms of economics, public health, um, other qualitative benefits. So I'll drop that in. And that, that was our source for a lot of those um, studies. Yeah, and having all of that information is so important in one location. So that was great to have that resource. Um, we're actually at the end of our time here. So I don't want to take us over too long. If you did not get your question answered, but you have a very specific question for an individual panelist, for instance, feel free to reach out to them specifically. If you have larger questions about the Great American Rail Trail or other rail trail related things, feel free to reach out to me specifically as well. Um, but thank you all very much for your time. Brandon, Megan, Liz, thank you for your expertise and knowledge, sharing that with everybody. We will talk to you all again soon. Thank you very much for joining today. Mm -hmm.